Hey, it's MJ from the Coaches Panel. I hope you're well and welcome to an AFL Fantasy Strategy Roundtable where we talk you through all the big issues of the week for AFL Fantasy. And there is a ton of stuff we've got to get through. There's new DPPs that are about to hit the game in just a handful of days. There are some urgent trade-out conversations we've got to have. There's some falling premium midfielders that we've got to unpack and a ton of other stuff helping me do it on this episode as they do most weeks. Mini Monk, good to see you, my friend. Up and about in the Content Creators Cup too, by the way, the only undefeated person. How are you? And lots to chat about this week in AF, isn't there? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks. Thanks to you, actually. You, you knocked off one of the other two that were undefeated alongside me. So that put me to the top five and oh, but I've got a lot of good coaches nipping on my heels as well. It's a very competitive year this year, but I'm very good. I'm very, I'm very excited to talk about AFL fantasy this week. I'm very glad you said you've got a lot of good coaches and then you didn't go and also MJ. So I'm glad you kept me in that sentence. <laughs> it didn't need to be said. <laughs> Which is good. And also fellow co-founder of the coaches panel, Rids is on board, mate. Uh, a ripping year from you so far. And this feels like a really important week for us in AFL fantasy, doesn't it? Well, it's a massive week for me anyway, because this is the three ruck strategy. What's going to happen now is anyone's guess, yeah? So let's go delve into a few strategies because I have no idea where I'm going with this. <laughs> <laughs> it could get really interesting. Um, we're in the final week of best 18 in this current Form. We do have another bunch of weeks in the middle buy rounds of the year, but no Tigers, no Demons this week. They are available to be moved in and out of your team through trades, through loopholes, however you want to use them this week. And while I do want to talk about best 18 strategies as we get into the mid-year buys in the next couple of rounds, I'm keen on both your lads' reflections on what it means for us Next year. Now, this is obviously being very presumptuous, but I, I think based off everything we've heard from the AFL over the past six weeks, they were thrilled with how opening round went. The NRL, as an aside, were thrilled with how their experiment went in Vegas as well. So you've got these two worlds colliding that give me every kind of suggestion that we're going to hit another opening round, for sake of a better phrase, next year. We've now learnt it. We've seen it a little bit. We've never done it prior. What are some things, Mini Monk? I'm, Rids, I'm keen on your thoughts on this too in a minute, but what are some lessons that we can put in our little note tabs on our phone on the premise that we do start the year with an opening round, whether it's eight teams, 18 teams, whatever it is, kind of doesn't matter, but we get a block of early buys and teams missing. What are some like takeaways you'd encourage coaches to kind of hold on to just to reflect for future seasons, if and when we have another batch of early best 18 matchups. One big one that I'll talk about that I don't think a lot of coaches have kind of looked at is just how tight it actually keeps the competition. So about this time last year, so round four last year, the point separation between a hundredth and a thousandth was about 150 points. This year, it's only 140. It's 10 less, yeah. which, you know, you might not say that that's a lot, but in the scheme of things, if you talk about 10 points of ranking difference at this stage of the year, if you're talking about, say, from a thousandth down, that might be another 100 coaches. So it's not important to get too fixated on what your ranks are during these best 18 rounds because everyone's really condensed. There's not a huge amount of gain. There's not a huge amount of loss, but there's still room that you can move in. And I think one of the other really big ones is just how important it is to know where your strengths and weaknesses lie across the buy rounds as well. Because when this best 18 is hit, we've seen that last week was probably the trickiest round, which was when most people had the most amount of premiums missing. You know, we're talking the likes of Heaney, Grundy. Uh, Roberts was also missing on that buy as well. Dacos. Dacos yeah, was missing. Yeah. It made it a bit harder for people to try and get a really good score out there. That was also combined with the fact that we had some rookies that were injured, dropped a lot of really poor premium scores. But in, I guess, any other best 18 weeks, they'd be rounds two, three, or uh, or even this week, that probably would have been hidden a bit more and you wouldn't have been as hurt. Um, I think looping 
using these rookies is something that people have explored. But being able to manage that with the DPP across lines has actually been really tricky for people. You know, I've seen a lot of people getting caught out with putting a player that plays early in their utility spot and then not being able to adjust how they get a better score onto field or whether or not they should be taking another player's score. Like there was a lot of people that went, oh, I'll take Lake House as 68 this week only for Closey and Graham to come out and go 94 and 104 respectively. Mm. And that's something that I think we'll start to explore is just how much we can try and push it with the rookies that were looping, just how much we can try and push it in terms of maximizing the scores that we get on field. Uh, and then also knowing like how we can try and cover the premiums and, and mid prices that we do want to keep throughout the early buys and into the main portion of the season without compromising on the score that we get on any particular week. Yeah, Reed, I'm, I'm curious for you. One of the uncertainties for, for coaches in the community was around starting these, and I use this term maybe a bit loosely, but premiums, top-end scoring options with early buys. So Dacos, Whitfield, you could argue had a bit of value in him, Tom Green, Goulden. Um, these are top-line scorers as we potentially – Again, just little notes, open the tab, keep it for starting squads next year. Is, is there anything in your eyes that goes, look, starting premiums was a at that upper end and upper echelon was a right or wrong starting squad approach? The interesting thing that I found this year, and I don't know whether this is just something that just happened, okay? We were all trying to jump on that value premium, whether it was the mid, whether it was an Amon, whether it was a new curb, whoever it was, okay? And then someone like a steel was always, you know, hindsight says he was the only really value mid premium at that point, at, on that range, you know what I mean? In that range, yeah. So. One of the things that highlighted to me was going the top, top end of the premiums. Now, we heard a lot of talk about guns and rooks and everything else, okay, in the preseason due to the best 18, four out of the six rounds. One of the things for me was it still comes with risk. Going those mm. top end premiums, you know, and we've seen it with Bontempelli just last week, yeah? So mm. he was priced at 117. We should be still not forgetting to look for value in those not going pure guns and rooks. Look at English. Like, yeah. there's always going to be cases like Zach Merritt or Rowan Marshall at this point in time or someone like yeah, that. Connor but Rosie. The thing was, yeah, yeah. yeah, but the thing was, there's so much value in the rucks right now, you know. So, But the other thing I noticed was we're very reactive we're very, very, and we're quick to react in fantasy mm. world. So looking back now, we jumped at shadows a lot, whether it was a Wilson, whether it was a Harley Reid. And it's easy to be very picky, like, and pull out these out, guys, whether it's mm -hmm. someone like, you know, we get a little bit picky at times. Now, in AFL fantasy, when someone doesn't become that cash generator quickly, we tend to get impatient and we don't give them mm. time to fall into line to actually find their feet a little bit. We are talking about mm. 18, 19 year old kids having their first couple of games of football, like a uh, Wilson, for instance, at a new club sure. trying to read. Yeah. yeah. Read, you know, with all that pressure on him, but we were very quick. So what we did do was we lost of sight of job security on the rookies. And we started mm. going for that, that quick bang buck, you know. I want that buck to come quickly. I'm going to jump off this guy straight away. But we forgot and we lost sight of job security. I'm not saying everyone, but just us sure. as a community. And then suddenly what happens is we hear it from one podcast. We hear it on 100 podcasts. There's only one person being talked about on every mm. single podcast day to day until the next one comes mm. up. And at times, MJ, these quick turnarounds, okay, with the Thursday night games and everything else, just means that you are heavily influenced if you keep hearing the same message over and over again. There's a less 24-hour less period, whether like I know that's terrible English, but I don't really care. No. Um, but like you think about Easter Monday, you think about Anzac Day coming up, you think about mm -hmm. Thursday night football all the time. It's just quick turnarounds in this 
period of time and we're all trying to make a quick buck yeah yeah so we lose sight of what the end goal is like and at times what i found okay is everyone's going okay let's go hunting cash right now okay let's do this right now but what we have lost sight of is has anyone really looked at the mid-season buys as strongly mm. as what they could have over the last couple of weeks was trading in and we, let's think about it this week okay drury biggie newen like they're all mm. round 12 buys you know is that mm. going to hurt us in forward lines or back lines because you know you think whitfield sheasel there's a few there that, that actually you know um wanganine miller um mm-hmm. is another there's a few of them for round 12. If you've got a few of them and you've only got four, three of the four main premium forwards on round mm-hmm. 12 by as well, and then you might have a steal and you might be looking to trade it in someone else like a Tom Green or whether it's mm-hmm. an Errol Goulden or whoever it is, wow, we, we're going to be in a world of pain, yeah? It, yeah. it could be very I, interesting. Ne- next week is something that's... Uh, interesting as well because we do have a wednesday night game and a thursday afternoon game and Mm -hmm. there are some very popular targets from teams that play in those games i mean the biggest one being a nick dacos who plays on that thursday early afternoon before we even get teams for the rest of the week we've got a clayton oliver Mm -hmm. and a a christian petrarca that are playing on the wednesday afternoon or when the evening as well as a max gorn we've got zach merritt darcy parish uh, people are looking at a Jai Coldwell as well. Like, yep, for four. If you're not considering the players that you're trading into next week and where their fixture might lie as well, I would implore you to look at it because I know we're going to talk about him a bit later, but Dacos is a very high target for a lot of coaches who don't have them. And if you aren't mm-hmm. looking to try and get onto him this week, you're probably looking to get onto him next week for that favorable fixture. And it could be very scary to go into that fixture without actually knowing the rest of the teams. So I would be Absolutely. very very interested to see how you're kind of setting up for that um, and how you're planning your team to exit these buys like we do when we plan to exit the mid-season buys as well. You always want to come out with a team that's much better than what you started with and you want to come out with a team that where all the players slot into the positions that you want them to slot into. Yeah, it's a good thought, which probably leads us to the sentiment of the week or the, the thought process of the week. And, and double mm. downgrade feels like a a loaded terminology to me because mm. I, I don't know if it's really truly what coaches are saying. Really what they're saying is getting off options that are either stalled or dead and then going and getting – we've got a plethora of cash cows still available for us. Uh, based on the stats of the top 1,000 places like a DFS Australia, give you really good line of sight of these top-line options. Seriously, mm-hmm. if you have not gone to DFS Australia, it's not just a daily fantasy draft stars tool. It is one of the great tools uh, of this era of AFL fantasy for us. But there's a few that still don't have closey. There's Combin, who's around through there. Graham is a highly, if not, I think he's the most traded in option this week. There's Garcia, there's Drury, there's Biggie. There, there is a ton of options and considerations we have to make. Um, Minnie, how much of what we do this week is based on, as you've alluded to, the trades people want to make over the next fortnight, whether it be the Dacos trade, for example, like 20% of the top thousand, I think, own him. So it's it's really sparse at the top end for a player um, of his quality, let alone his overall then ownership numbers. Does the downgrade or the trades you make to cash cows is probably a better phrase this week. Is that dependent on what your squad looks like this week or is it more contingent on the trades you want to make over the next fortnight? It's actually lower, by the way. It's 13% of the top 1,000 teams that own day costs. Wow. It's not many. And if you think about that, if you thought about it at the start of the year when we said that it was about 60%, 65% ownership across the entire oh, format had Dacos, that's going to be a lot of people that will be moving towards him very quickly. Mm-hmm. But in terms of the trades that you're making this week and how much that affects what you want to be doing for the next two or three or even four weeks, it has to. 
you have yeah. to be considering what your moves are for the next two or three or four weeks and where you want to be moving to, the players you want to be moving to, the players you want to be moving off of because the amount of cash that you carry in this week will dictate who you can target next week, which will dictate who you can target the week after. We talk about the upgrade cadence in terms of the players and you want to try to be bringing in a premium each week. If you do go for that upgrade this week and it is only to someone saying that 600 to 700 to maybe even 800k marker does that mean you can only get another 700k player in the week after that and the week after that and the week after that whereas if you do let's let's call it a double downgrade or maybe even a double rookie fix and you can bank 250 to 300 thousand dollars this week does that allow you to get a premium next week and cull a couple of rookies that are a bit better to cull maybe it's a, a cadman maybe it's a seth campbell maybe it's a house and still be able to get to someone like a Dacos or even to a Walsh a week later or to a Flanders and then still be able to do an upgrade the week after that to another player who's at that 850, 900K bracket. Like, is having those two better, quote-unquote, premiums in in over three weeks better than getting three maybe premiums over that three-week period? Time will tell, but I think that that's a decision that you have to make yourself about who you're wanting to bring in and who's the targets that you're looking at because that should dictate whether you are going for, I guess, a couple of rookies this week, be it, you know, you talked about Graham being the most traded in player. He's 100% going to be, but then it's the likes of Drury, people who miss Closey, you've got Garcia, you've got Nguyen. There's a few really good low break even options. The week after, we even got a Kane McCall if he were coming off his bye. Yes, he didn't have the greatest score, but he has scoring potential in him. Mm. Those are the sort of things that we have to consider when we're making our trades this week. Yeah, I'm curious then, you know, while, while I've got you on that, does the fix-up correctional trade, because is that important for us to get this week too? Like I'm I'm looking at a bunch of names in our sides at the moment, like you've got Amari Hoare, who, who should be back after the D's by mm. you've got a Nick Caulfield, a, a lot of teams are running with him, a, a Zach Reed, a, a Jai Clark probably feels unfair to say he's a, a dead cow because he's at least playing, but in terms of cash generation, it's dead. Um, and they're mm. at the lower end of sub 350k, all of these guys. Is this mm. also the week given we've got a bounty of sub 300k options that look like they've got job security is that also a factor for you in who and why you're looking at two cash cows in this week i'd, I'd be very hesitant to say that they have job security they might look like they do but those teams have players missing who all look like they're returning mm -hmm. i think that it's symptomatic of the fact that coaches probably unless they have two bigger issues which i, I think is very unlikely should be getting off Colby McCoach this week. Yeah. Um, he, his break even has gone to an 87, which is, I believe, higher than any other score that he's had. He's had one score that's higher than that this year, which was in yeah, round, like one. round one. Yeah. And it took him eight marks to get to that. And he's been moved around in terms of role. His role has been very volatile. He's had an injury, so they'll probably rest him and ease him back into the next game. He's not going to get back up to a 470K price tag for at least another five to six weeks after this. Yeah, it so really does feel it's, with him. It's a so five-week move or not, yeah. And, and and I think that when you're saying, right, if, you're, you, if your downgrade option is, say, a McCurch to a Graham, which I think will probably be the, the most popular trade this week, that's only 150K. And if you haven't got 200K in the bank, you can't make a fully-fledged upgrade this week with that money. Not and really. so when you don't have that, if you don't have any other issues, why not fix one of the bigger issues, which is a cow that's stalled, like a Jai Clark, who his break even is only 50, but he's not moving in price. And Nick Caulfield, not moving in price, won't be back in the team anytime soon. Uh, Harvey Gallagher, whose break even has gone up to a, you know, a 51, I believe it is, 41 already. And he only scored a 39 on the weekend. Like mm. if you can make, 100k 150k and go to someone who plays this week with a minus 30 or a minus 20 break even and make another 50k for them that is a world where you can kind of say i'm delaying my upgrade so that i can get a better player next week i'm fixing a cow that's definitely dead to a cow that might make some money might have a bit of job security and i'm just at least regenerating at least i'm doing something to fix my team up to prepare me for next week that's that's the kind of idea behind it 
Yeah, it's helpful. Rids, I'm, I'm, we were going to talk about it a little bit later. I'm, I'm keen on your thoughts. I think it's a good time to talk about it. It is this uh, no, interesting. Just before we do that, MJ, I yes. want to go back to the double downgrade for a sec. Okay. Because of course, yeah. I want to call out to Mitch and Luke because they had a really good discussion on the pod the other day. Fancy it was. I, yep. I was just driving back from Canberra and I was listening to it. And they had a really good discussion. The thing that's been missed in this is the double downgrade may happen this week, okay? Mm. But do you free up enough cash? Have you got enough cash left over to do a double upgrade next week? That's the thing that's really mm. – because if you've got three rucks, MJ, and you've got a cherry and a and Grundy, and you have 400K sitting in the bank, mm-hmm. can't you get two 900,000 guys next week while there's a surplus of good rookies this week? In theory, yeah. Potentially, yeah. Yeah. Especially if you're going to go, say, let's just say hypothetically a cherry to a marshal, mm. one of the trades. Yeah, so it's only a couple straight hundred. away, because that, that we're talking about, and it doesn't have to be a fattened rookie to mm. someone. Now, we're going to talk about Matt Crouch later, but all the Matt Crouch owners right now, you've got a surplus of guys there that you can free up 150 200,000 okay put it on Matt Crouch's head and get someone that's going to be there for a long term that's got a little bit more security around it it's really is and I I know we always say this yeah it's team dependent but there's none sure. bigger than right now so the double downgrade I oh, you called it bench hygiene last year MJ trying to keep that cash ticking over as we continually go because the deeper we go into the season, the more we want to generate that cash. Yeah, correct. And when that disappears away from us, when we lose that ability to do it, it, it impacts that trade cadence, you know, that terminology that that Mini Monks also introduced into the community over the past year or so is this, if your bench hygiene's poor, it means your trade cadence suffers, which means as each week those two elements get handcuffed and hurt, you find yourself that upgrade or two upgrades behind everyone. And that's where you feel like you're constantly chasing the pack. And apologies for um, that, MJ. I just had my son that I haven't seen for a few days coming in to say goodnight. Okay. So that's my okay, apologies. Um, but, okay. yeah, Maybe that's the whole thing. Too. It is it is team dependent, yeah? Yeah, it is. So, so if, if it suits your team, and it suits your plan. If you traded into Flanders two weeks ago and you traded into Marshall last week, there's no one yeah. really jumping out at you. And For you've got week, a Jai sure. Clark, you've got a McKercha, you've got whoever it is, okay, a Gallagher. Why not mm. do that bench hygiene this week under the um, the best 18 rule, especially if you've got yeah. 19 good options, okay, to choose from this week? Mm. It's very much an... It's, it needs to be a bigger discussion than what we're seeing. And I understand because pretty much I've heard all week, okay, oh, yeah, we're not fans of it, we don't recommend it, whatever. And it doesn't matter who it is. The sure. thing is, have we ever had best 18 this early in a season before? Have we no. ever had two teams where we haven't had the relevant players being available like on the buy this week? Outside of Gorn, I can't even mm. think of really one relevant it's premium not. that's missing outside there, of Gorn. There it's isn't. I, I, I put out a tweet last night about it, or Monday night about it, depending on when you're listening to this. Aside from Gorn, who is a whopping 93% owned in the top 1,000, huge. there were only two other players that are more than 10% owned that are missing this week. Yeah. And it's Seth Campbell and Blake Howes. If yeah. you don't own either of those, or if you own one of them, you can only loop across one line. If you own Gorn, you probably can't loop unless you've got a Jackson or you're running a, a Cherry and a Marshall or a Cherry and a Grundy or whatever or it is. Yeah. So like the, the scope of being able to actually implement a loophole like we've been able to do the previous three best 18 weeks this year and be mm. able to look at a couple of rookie scores is not there. You are no, not going to be fielding the rookies that you have as being your best rookies, be it the likes of Roberts, Sharp, Closey, Graham, Reed. Like you, you just whatever you, Sharp you're just or, having yeah. to cop whatever there is 
and play that and then I'm all the way and yeah. and this it's a it's a basically a litmus test for what we're going to get next week because essentially you're going to put Gorn back onto your field if you've owned him and nothing else in your team will really change aside from the trades that you make that week so how your team looks now and how I guess I guess aside from maybe the DPP that kicks through your team and being able to shuffle sure. some players around there but how your team looks now is going to be pretty similar to how your team's going to look next week and for some yep. reason, this is a unicorn season, okay, MJ? Can you remember a year where the defense line is the highest scoring line? Like, oh, and then the oh, rookies yeah. just oh, keep yeah. coming, whether it's Closey or I can't Graham. pronounce his name, Closey or whatever. Graham. They, they just I thought keep you couldn't coming. pronounce Graham. Yeah, well, him too. And then we're going to have guys like Nick Martin and like, Bonner, Bonner and like, Roberts, yeah. all Roberts. Of those guys coming through. Like how Fisher many even. defenders? Like this is a unicorn year. You know what I mean? It is like tough. it's just let's not go back to last year or the year before or how, what we've done in the past because I cannot remember a year like this. No, n- neither. It, it feels very almost inverse of what we got last year, which was load up on forwards. That's where the scoring is. This year, it feels like our defender premiums feel like the safest of the bunch. And um, even the forwards, it, though, MJ, you think about it. We got Zach Fisher that's going to be a defender. We got Flanders. Yeah. Who knows where he's going to end up with the percentages, okay? We got Common. Unfortunately, we he can't so get it. No, yeah. that'd be nice. But yeah, you, no. you see what I mean? Even the guys that are going to gain, it's all a defense at the moment. It's everything's yeah, about correct. defense. It, it's true. Like we, we've just released a video in the past, um, you know, Tuesday afternoon that came out over on YouTube. You can go and if you haven't already followed the coaches panel, there, jump on over, hit subscribe notifications on. There's a video there. Jaden Papowski has given us a ton of great info. He's been sharing widely throughout the preseason and season proper. There's, it looks like 30, 30 plus DPPs are about to come our way, Mini Muck. Yeah, there is. And I, and I just want to correct you on one thing because I've had a chat to the great man as well. And I, and I just want to correct it. I believe his surname's pronounced Poposki, not Papowski. Oh, sorry, sorry Jaden. Well, I'm just oh, trying to Poposki do a right favor. Give him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I could see DP. Liam just pulling his hair out at you, MJ, mispronouncing oh. surnames and everything. It, it's That's my, just it's terrible my, by you. The, He's the D'Ambrosio of content creators in AFL fantasy, is he? Like, everyone will say the surname wrong. But you're right. Like, if you haven't checked it out, there's about 30 names. In terms of forward gains, Sanders is the most uh, classic relevant that is probable, but that's purely dependent on his mid-roll this week with no Liberatore. Mm. He's right on that threshold already. He's already, I think it's like 38% forward. So there's a world where he doesn't gain it. Um, there's a ton of mids. There's one ruck, but in AFL fantasy, it's only probably draft relevant. Sam Darcy, mm. I'm alluding to. And then as Rids has so beautifully mentioned, it's just an absolute onslaught of defenders um, and, and not really being able to maximise those defenders in their available space um, yeah. as, as quickly as easy. Uh, and I do just want to say with those defenders, like, most teams are probably running three, maybe four premium type defenders in their teams already. We're talking the likes of Sheasel, Whitfield, Young, Stewart, Yo. Who else is there as well? There's even Oh Dacos. Players. You could you could probably Dacos as yeah. well. Like Wanganine, Wanganine, Miller, Miller. Miller. Like, and then we're getting the likes of Martin being added, uh, Roberts being added. Like, we're gonna end up with DPP players in our midfield. Okay. Don't feel okay. compelled that you have to trade them out immediately. Don't feel compelled that you you don't don't see that you're having to run a Yo or having to run a Martin or having to run a Roberts in your midfield for three or four weeks as a downside because it's not. Like if they're scoring at a level where it's comparable to players at their price point that are also in doing the, the same line. thing, then it's a good thing. Then you have the yep. flexibility to be able to say, this is the one I want to trade out this week because their run's coming to an end and this player's got a better run and I can move into this midfield or I can move into this forward whenever you want to. Just be very yeah. content sitting with it. Like, if, if anything, it's just a blessing, not a curse. Yeah, absolutely. It um, adds flexibility. That's the main thing, yeah? Yes. It adds yes. a lot of flexibility. But be careful, especially in AF, okay? I know Supercoach and DT is another discussion, but for AF sure. specifically, price that points. You've got to keep monitoring that price that points as they go mm. along. Because um, yeah, that's do. what's going to catch you out. 
because there is going to be guys that are dropping like the Dawson's, like the Gouldens and everything else. Mm. And it might actually, you know, if you're not monitoring it, you might get caught out and you might miss one of those bigger type guys bottoming in out. Yeah, that's true. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about those bottoming out midfield, especially midfield premiums for that reason is it, it's Powell, it's Heaney, um, and it's Flanders that feel like the essential forwards and then you could have a conversation yeah. about others. There's, there's back line for days that really after Dacos, and we'll get to him in a moment, there's probably not a defensive premium you're looking at. And we'll talk about those midfield falling options in a moment. But we talked about double downgrades and team dependencies. Like this is a really interesting round for people. Um, Matt Crouch, maybe we should stop and have a, a quick 60-second come-to-Jesus conversation about Matt Crouch. Um, he's been okay for his owners. He's, he's probably been better than yeah. okay. He's been good for his he's owners. He's averaged 102, uh, MJ. He's point. been very good for his owners. Okay. Um, there are some that would say he's been so good, I'm just going to hold it. It's a one-week suspension. He's going to come straight back in. But Mini, is this potentially a, a gift horse that we might be needing to take advantage of? I think his suspension is a blessing for owners. It's a perfect jump-off opportunity. He has done his job. His job wasn't to be a top eight midfielder. His job was to make you 150K and be a flip to the premium that you want to grab at round six, which, funnily enough, is where we're at. He's been suspended for a week. The midfield mix is adjusting a bit as the Crows are trying to, you know, bring some other players in there. Sam Berry kicks the match-winning goal for them. That might affect his role coming into round seven, even if he gets back yep. into the team. Don't play simple. I Don't try and get too cute with it. Just play it nice and simple and just flip him. Yeah, I, I couldn't have said it any better. There, there's a world where he doesn't even get back into the team. I know that feels blasphemy to say at the moment, but there, there is a world um, where he does struggle to get back in, given how good Barry was. Um, there's a bunch of cows that we do need to get to. McKercher, I think, is a fair shout to to move on this week as well. Um, yep. There's some interesting guys, Rids. Regardless of whether Sanders gets DPP, Sanders is nearing that ledge for us. Wilson's a couple of weeks away. Reed's a couple of weeks away. Roberts is a couple of weeks away. And I do want to talk Bonner, Fisher, and a few others in a moment. But we are getting to this interesting junction of the year where it's, are we going to trade these guys out at their quote-unquote peak price? Or are we happy to start losing ten, fifteen, twenty, thirty thousand dollars in order to get ourselves structurally where we want to with our upgrade cadence? Okay, first things first, I've got to correct something that I got wrong earlier. Long drive, I might have mentioned still as a round twelve yeah. buy. I did and Wanganine use... Miller. And Wanganine Miller. It's yeah. it's been a long day. Um, I let that one slide to the keeper. But right. the, that one there. So let's look at the forwards though, MJ. Go through Please. your team and actually remove your t round 12 guys. And there's four oh, teams on it. It's nice and simple, yeah? It's GWS, it's Sydney, it's North, and who's the other one? Sorry. It's not St Kilda. <laughs> GWS, Sydney, North, and Brisbane. Oh, Brisbane, yeah. sorry. My bad. So. Yeah, as I say, long day. Um, so go through and remove those guys because you might have a Fisher. You might have a Pow. You might have a Heaney. You might have, you know, okay. North Melbourne, you know, the guys down the lower end. Yeah, um, Go Drury, and Cadman, Cadman, Cadman. Drury, Newen. You know, it just doesn't stop. No. It just keeps going and going. And if you have five, six of them, and you're going to trade out a Harley Reid to save 20000 at this point in time, mm -hmm. and you're keeping a Cadman or whoever else, then potentially I'd go, you know what? You're not doing yourself a service there. You're doing yourself a disservice. You want to try and actually enter the buys as well set up as you can. And I know there's still multiple weeks until the buys, but it doesn't mean that we just keep adding on to our pain that's happening in, pain. in a few weeks' time, yeah? So, yeah. and we do have three trades. We do have, there's, a, there's potential that there's a lack of, round 12 premiums in the midfield outside of green and golden sure like mm -hmm. there is potential of that okay yeah, but the it. fact of the matter is you've got the ldus you've got a few others that linger through as well maybe yeah. a dunkley maybe a Lockie neil becomes really available 
at that point in sure. time. By trading into a Drury this week or a Big Inuan this week, you might be limiting and hamstringing yourself from going and jumping on a Lockie Neal. And how many times have we seen it in the recent years gone by? Someone like a Lockie Neal is so cheap that it's just impossible yeah. to say no. Like, yeah. and he's, he's heading that way now. So mm. that's why a Matty Crouch, you know, we only just a couple of minutes ago discussed it. Why not go and set yourself up? Like, is yeah, yeah it's great. We all had that dream, okay? Those people that started Matty Crouch was going to run him through the mid-season buys. But guess what? He's been suspended Suspension. now. And yeah. mm. Monk's right, yeah? This could be a blessing in disguise because you could be jumping off him at the right time. And you yeah. might be grabbing that guy that you really, really want. It might be a Noah Anderson, for instance, this week. Yeah. Because before so, he goes yeah. spiking up on a really good run at the moment, who knows? It just depends. So have a look at your team. See what you've got in your buys. But guys like Wilson, guys like Reed. I wouldn't be trying to jump off them too quickly if you do have multiple, multiple others that you can't get into. And that's why Sanders is such an interesting conversation this week, yeah? yeah. If he gains that DPP, he's going to help us. Absolutely. Round 12 by. And then yeah. you can sheep them off and jump onto the next, you know? That's the time that we want to be going. And you saw how handy it is. Over the last couple of weeks when there was the buy, Flanders came off the bye. Who was the number one group think guy that wasn't a rookie that popped? Okay. It was Flanders. Mm. Who's the guy that we're going to talk about soon coming off a bye in defense that we were all yeah. scared not to start? That because mm. 50% of the community did, yeah. you know, and we're going to be talking about that. And we're going to be talking about do we jump on him early at 130 break even at 907? And we're going to be saying, well, Where's that tip line? Where's that? What yeah. makes you comfortable? What doesn't make you comfortable? Have you already got too many defenders to even explore it? Have you got a midfielder? Because 99% of the quality coaches out there and the quality teams that are in contention mm. will trade Dacos into their midfield. So they can actually have yeah. those guys coming up from the rookies and filling in for him and whatever else are the DPPs that are going to happen because there's going to be a lot of movement in the next couple of weeks mate after those DPPs yes. coming next week yeah there, there absolutely will be um I, I do want to talk about Dacos in in a little bit more depth in a moment but um talk to me mini monk there, there is a relatively popular couple of guys there that we should spend a few moments on at least in Bonner and Fisher. I know some moved them on a few weeks ago, um, not happy with a weak performance and have jumped off. There's still a bunch of the commutes on each of these guys. Um, how important are they to potentially look to move off in the next two to three weeks or can we afford to run them a little bit deeper into the season? I, I think that these two are very different in terms of what they're achieving for your teams sure i think bonner has done a great job in making a lot of coin for coaches and he's done it with some very good scoring as well mm. it's started to slow down a little bit the last couple of weeks but it's still ticking along but mm. they've also had some relatively softer fixtures which he has been able to take advantage of he's coming nearer to a price which is what you would say is close to what his max price might get to He's sure. kind of seven hundred thousand dollars. I'm not sure I see him getting past. I don't think. I don't think I see him getting to the eight hundreds. I can see him in the high seven hundreds though. Yep. But it's these sorts of players that you can use to upgrade to a premium very easily. And because mm. he's in that midfield and he will get the midfield defender status, you can take your pick of whichever of those lines you're wanting to get from. Absolutely. If we could contrast that to someone like a Zach Fisher, who I think is probably the the easy contrast point. He's going at about 80 if you exclude that round one game. And that round one game, he had a bit of an off game, didn't do quite as well. But since then, he's averaged basically about an 81 and 82 score. Can you trade him to a premium forward that is going at least 15 points per game better than him with confidence? If you're trading him to well, Heaney, maybe. Sure. Landers, maybe. Zorko, yep. maybe. Maybe. Pal, Pal. maybe. But outside Jackson. of those four... Mm. I'm not yeah. sure I'd even say Jackson is a potential no. to go at a 97. From, from here on, no. Yeah. no. Yeah. 
So if you're looking for, if you're saying I can trade them to someone that's averaging more than 95 from here on forward, so up until say the buys, then consider it. But I don't feel confident that there is anyone that's worthwhile trading him to at this stage of the year. I think he's very comfortable as a player just to sit at F4 from here until round 12. And at round 12, we can reassess again if there's other forwards that have popped, if there's DPP that's coming through. It's on his buy. We can make the most of that then. But between then and now, he can just sit there unless lane changes. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about Nick Dacos. Um, oh, it was the boy. dilemma of the preseason for so many coaches. Um, oh, yes. After... Uh, the end of opening round, he pumps out a really nice score in the first week. Non-owners are going, oh, no, this is going to hurt. And I think probably in totality, he's kind of ended up where I think most coaches would say that feels about right, which is he looks like barring a monster score against Port Adelaide this week with that break even of 131. He will drop under 900,000. And let's round it and say that about 100,000 off his starting price. The poor game against Port Adelaide didn't really happen. Rather, that happened a few weeks early against St Kilda, which was meant to be the gravy matchup, given um, the, the history of scoring that had been there and the matchups historically. Um, Rids, you alluded, and Minimark, I know you've alluded to him again too. The plan was to always bring him in post buy, whether it was this week against Port Adelaide or to maximize the Anzac Day matchup and then the subsequent strong run. The question feels too simple to ask it this way, but maybe it's the best way to start. How urgent of a priority is getting Nick Dacos Rids into our side in this next fortnight, both in how and when? Team dependent, MJ. Absolutely Thanks, team dependent. Is what's the biggest issue in your team right now? Can you get yeah. your biggest issue to Dacos? Have you got someone to go to Dacos? Who are you culling to get the free up the cash? We just talked about a guy that is absolutely interesting, yeah? Riley Bonner. Mm -hmm. He's made so much cash right now. It's only two hundred thousand to jump to Dacos, like from now, yeah. And we've got enough fat rookies, like even a Sanders right now. We could go Sanders to Garcia to free up a couple hundred thousand to to actually Done. free up to get Bonner. Mm -hmm. Right now, though, he's got a break even of one hundred and thirty-one. He's playing Port Adelaide, who isn't like I wouldn't say it's going to be his bogey team, but. I would no, say no, there's awesome. enough restrictiveness in that matchup to say, mm. hey, is that going to provide a ceiling 150 score for Dacos? And is that going to hurt you? Yes, it's going to hurt you for the points, but is it going to hurt sure. you for the dollars? No, not at all. So if you don't get him this week, you have to plan to get him the week after. That's the whole priority, okay? It depends on what your issues are this week and how you can get him in the week after. They're the two challenges and how you've got to manage your team. And that's what Monk's been saying earlier. You don't trade this week with only this week in focus. You've got to trade mm. this week with next week, the week after in focus. What's your Absolutely. plan to go to? Who are you going to go to? Because really, if we're going to go one up and one down, and we're bringing in, let's just say hypothetically, we're bringing in uh, someone who's, a mid-price, a spe speculative type Caldwell, whether it's a Lukosius, Precious. whether yeah. it's, you know, one of those types. Are we actually hampering ourselves next week because we're actually using cash mm. to get someone who we really want in day cost the week after? That's Correct. where you're going to hamstring yourself. And that's why the double downgrade is such a viable option. Who are this you week. bringing in? Who are you upgrading? And there's going to be teams out there, yeah, that have got enough money to go jump on a Nor Anderson from a McCurcher because they had a couple of hundred. Then they did a Sanders down and could get McCurcher. Yeah, great. Sure. That's perfect. Well done. Awesome for you. You've managed them mm. well. Luck has been, luck has fallen your way this time. Mm. But how many times has luck 
not fall in our ways and we've missed our dream trade by two thousand or one thousand dollars it happens yeah. too many times yeah every year yeah and mm. all because we ended up jumping on a massimo we jumped on a caldwell i'm not saying caldwell's a bad selection I'm no just it's just an illustration example. Yeah, you know, that's, good. that's the type of guys that we want to bypass and we want to yep. put the priorities. And it doesn't have to be this week's priorities in. It can be what's no. your priority next week? What do you need to do this week to make that priority a reality? Yeah, it's good. Mini, I'm, I want to talk Sam Walsh in a, a second and then some falling premiums before we wrap up the episode. But if I you do just don't, to- yeah. yeah. Oh, I did just want to talk a bit more about Dacos. I know that... I'm no, sure I, I did want to ask you a Dacos it. question. I am, yeah. Sure. Was, if you, Okay, was... we don't get him this week for non-owners. We don't yep. get him. That's fine. Um, the week after, you mentioned that they play before the, the rest of the teams get announced and things like that. How long can we afford to go without Nick Dacos? Because as you mentioned, 13% in the top thousand owned. He was the target and plan now. We don't do it this week because mm. we've got the cows available. Sure, next week, no, I couldn't quite get to it. I didn't know teams. How long are we prepared to kick this can down the road? As good as our premium defenders are, we do not want to run the gambit too long of not owning Nick Dacos. Nick Dacos last year, excluding the game where he was tagged by Finn McGuinness and got injured, averaged 112. He is priced currently at 105. So that's seven points of upside there, let alone the fact that there is only two defenders currently that are averaging more than 110 in Lockie Whitfield and Harry Sheasel. If you can go to a player who has seven points of upside and is probably guaranteed to be a top three in their line at what might be their lowest price for, say, eight to ten weeks, given the fact that that 60-odd against St. Kilda is dropping out of his price cycle in round eight, Mm, you have to go there. I think that this week, it's probably a coin toss. It's very team-dependent as to whether you go to him. I would be structuring my trades this week almost with the intention that Dacos is the player to get next week. I don't think it matters that he has the earlier game because I think that he is a genuine vice captaincy option or even a captaincy option in that game. I don't think I'd want to trade into him this week if I can avoid it, but if it works for your team, it might be the way to go. But he genuinely could be the difference between a, th- a thousand rank and 500 rank in the space of two or three weeks, depending on how he goes straight away after that point of late game. I, yeah, I, I just, I just, yeah, I'm going to play devil's advocate for a little bit here. Okay. Now we've just talked about defenders in midfield. Okay. So it's mm. not going to be defender versus defender at this point in time. It might be day cost against a midfielder that's priced at 105 and it's going to be the other option that you Mm -hmm. can get to outside of Dacos and what you believe in and how your team is set up because right now we've got that much with defence and I think one of the things that changed from the pre-season MJ is we never thought there was going to be Sheasel and Whitfield like comparable you know, no. maybe a Nick Martin potentially with another pop score in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Potentially. Like, we just didn't think, we thought it was going to be day costs and then day and life points. to the next. Yeah. yeah it's, it's not working out that way. So, no. we're not doing day costs versus defense premiums right now. We could be doing day costs versus the mid premiums at those, and we're seeing a lot of those guys: Bonton, Pelly, Dawson, Good. Oliver. Dawson. You know, yeah. it doesn't. There's a lot yeah. of guys that have bottomed out. They just have to show us something, and we're going to go we're knocking wrong. on that door. It could be Golden. It could be anyone yeah. who's comparable to a day cost. So yes. don't just get stuck in. I must get day cost. Day cost is. Look at your team and work out what's your best, you know, what's your best option for it. 
there are only 12 players averaging over 110 currently this year. I'm, I'm excluding Sam Walsh because it's one game, and I think that that's... Yeah, just, yeah, small sample, sample size. size. Yeah. You can't look at that. Two of them are defenders. One of them's a Ruckman. The other nine are midfielders. Sorry, eight of them are midfielders, and one of them is a Ford in Heaney. Mm. If he is matching it with those midfielders and the other midfielders that you talk about, like a Bontempelli, like a Dawson, like a Goulden, I think they're all still coming down in price. If mm. Dacos goes 95 against Port Adelaide on the weekend, that's done. He yeah. He's at his bottom price. His break-even will reset to about... He's dropped the 100K, yeah. You aren't going to be fussing over 15, 20K at that point. And at that point, he could go 130 and just be at his bottom price from that point onwards. And that's when it's like, that's when it's a priority. Whereas like a Bontempelli, there might be a dime a dozen of those types of players. I know that Bontempelli averaged 120, 116 odd last year, and that could happen for the mm. rest of the season. I know that, Absolutely. you know, a Took Miller has done it before, a Goulden's done it last year as well. But when it's the positional scarcity that we're seeing, yes, he's not the clear number one defender this year, but there's still that positional scarcity and there's still that limited option of players that can be at the top of the line defensive line. I think it's just a gift horse that you can't keep looking in the mouth and yeah, eventually you just long. have to take a plunge. So I'm going to name yeah. some names that aren't average in 110 in the midfield. Tom Green mm -hmm. is one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then you've got Zach Butters is another. You've got Andrew Brayshaw. Mm -hmm. You've got guys like Errol Goulden. You've got Bontempelli. Mm -hmm. You've got Laird. Dawson. There's yeah. a lot. So, Larry. again, that's why you got to go in and see what's the best. And we've got two rookies in the defensive line at the moment that probably need to be on the ground. And, yes, we can put them on the ground in the midfield, but that's what I'm saying. The defenders in the midfield is really throwing a curveball, yeah? Mm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I agree with that. It's interesting. I, I want to come back to Sam Walsh in a minute. We do need to, to wrap up the episode shortly. Uh, but... I want to correct you yeah. first. You said oh, that you it's a 50-50 with Dacos. It's about even. I think the rankings suggest yeah. that's not the case. Oh, I rankings wise. Yeah, actually, that's fair. Because the fact is, people in that, what is it, 17% of the top 100 own Dacos right now? Was, oh, top 100. Was, yeah, no. sure. In the top yeah, 100? Oh, uh, let me just quickly check that out. It is, and it's 19.2% in the top 1,000. Uh, it is not 17%. It is 8%. 8%. Oh, I'm so, just going to start saying numbers and put percent on it and try to look smart. 27%. So the fact of the matter is that would suggest if he's 50% ownership across the board or there yeah. or thereabouts at the start of the year, then the people, non-owners, are ahead right now oh, absolutely they're ahead for sure yeah so yeah. that's just i just wanted to throw that out there that's fine yeah. no, no problem with that um so these falling premiums then you, you've mentioned a bunch of names you could you know sarong you could arguably say he's in that sentiment more in terms of people paid a million dollars for him and now he's falling back from that um, i do want to talk about sam walsh like i said in a little bit more depth but we do need to wrap up in a moment but how do we prioritise these guys? Not Dacos out of the mix, although we do have to factor him in there. I know it's hard, but how do we prioritise guys? Mini Mike, is it as simple as price stat, break-evens, and what we see? And no, is, is it just as elementary as that? Or do we need to start factoring some other layers, whether that be buy structure, trades, injuries, all those kind of elements as well? All of the above. All of the right. above and potentially more. I mean, we talk about someone like Clayton Oliver. I, I think I heard this chat on um, the Hardball Gets, po Hard Gets podcast and they're talking about how Clayton Oliver started the season like a house on fire, 30 touches, 30 touches, and it's been downhill since then. He doesn't have the match fitness to be able to keep him up until we see that turn around. I don't think we can really go near him, especially with the toss about his hand. Hmm. We talk about Laird and Dawson coming down in price. We talked about Matt Crouch not. 10 minutes ago, there's just so much role uncertainty associated yeah. with him. We just don't know where these players are going to be playing on week to week. We've seen Lair go to half back. We've seen Dawson go to full forward. The other two in that five that you've got on the screen right now in, in Goulden and Caleb Sarong, I think there's a bit more role security associated with them. I think mm. that Goulden is still playing about his 30 to 40% CBA mix and then playing a bit more outside, but he just hasn't had the fixtures to really accentuate where he scores well. And I think 
Sarong has just struggled the last couple of weeks as well because of fixtures, you know, come up against Carlton and, and Port Adelaide, which are about the two most restrictive inside midfield and matchups yeah. that you can see. But if you look at their next, you know, three weeks, it's Western Bulldogs, West Coast and Richmond and then Sydney, which are all pretty friendly matchups. So he's one that you could look to go for if you've got 950k of spare cash hanging around. Yeah. But it's just all of these things. It's, you know, what do you project the player to be going out? How cheap are they? When are the bad scores falling out of their cycle? What's their min price going to be? What's their fixture run coming up? What buy do they have? It's a melting pot that's all going to be factored in that you have to put together and eventually spit out the answer that you think best suits your team. As I say, it's team dependent. I can't analyze everyone's team and everyone's risk appetite and figure it out. But I think that those are the sort of things that I'd be considering when I'm making a decision about when it's the right time to jump on a player and when it's just time to let them give another week or two before you go for them. Or if you just let them go yep. full stop and say, I'll grab them in 10 weeks' time. Like yep. that's, Sometimes it's a reasonable approach. Yeah, absolutely. It is. Um, Rids, we've got to talk about Sam Walsh before we end the podcast. Oh, yeah. Um monster score from him break even in in the 70s range um if he goes anywhere near like what his history is not just what he did against the crows last week but his history he, he's well and truly on his way 900,000 plus heading towards 950 but where do you put him into this mix too because like you said you've got a dacos who's a, probably going to be cheaper than walsh next week you've got Greens, Bontempelli, Sarongs, the Crow pair, you know, even the D's pair of Oliver and Petrarca and Sarong, like so many great options. Where do we put Walsh in this order of prioritization? Because start of the year, he was really important to us. Back injury slowed his late preseason and obviously starts the year. How important is Walsh to us and how valuable is it as a maybe a trade for us this week? So he's priced at 102. So it all depends on what your expectation is that he's going to mm-hmm. average for the year from here yeah. to the end of the year. And you've got to remove the 145 to do that, okay? Yeah, you missed that. The other thing with the 145 that I just wanted to highlight, there was 90 stoppage points out of that 145. I came up with a stat in the preseason, MJ, that J- um, Jaden gave me. One in 17 only match when it's 55 or more. That's on their average, okay? Mm. Now, it's a small sample size. It's a one-off game. So, obviously, it's a monster score. So, we yep. were expecting things to be out of whack. 90 is just ridiculous, though, yeah? yeah it's crazy. That's a 90-55 split for stoppage to transition points. You do not expect that sort of ratios to continue, okay? No. And if you are looking at those ratios and that's the role that he's going to have, push, this, say the stoppage points down to 60, 55, and see what it looks like at the same ratios. That's yeah. where your expectation should be. And at priced at 102, there's just not, that much extra value there. I know it's value because we're looking at it right now. If he's what was his best year, MJ? Was it 109 uh, years uh, ago? He, he knocked on the door of 110 a couple of years ago. Yeah. So it's really a once off opportunity to get the value required. So it's either yeah. this week or none. Otherwise, mm. he's going to be at 105, priced at 104, 105, 106 yeah. next week, even with a 95. You're really going to be pushing it uphill. So it's really, really delicate, yeah? So is the value there? Is it not? Like, that's what you've got to work out. Does your team, is it looking for value? Is he just going to be through to his mid-season buy, then jump off to a whoever's had the earlier buy, a Goulden, for instance, or a Dunkley or a Neil or whoever? What is your end goal for it? Is it to be a season-long and, and sorry, monk keeper. We know that term uh, is pr- somewhat outdated these days because no one's really a season long keeper anymore. You can jump on and sure. off anywhere. But the fact of the matter is, what is your goal for it? You've got to decide with your team in mind because we're all biased towards our team at the end of the day. Yeah, when we give advice. Awesome, yeah. Because that's what we're living in. That's what, and all serious coaches, MJ, yeah. 
do you wake up and the first thing you're thinking about is fantasy football? And the, when you go to bed, the last thing you're thinking about when you go to bed, that's when the missus isn't awake, is fantasy football, yeah? So, I mean, we're all thinking about fantasy football. That's why we're regarded serious coaches. <laughs> yeah, it's not because we're any good. It just means that we don't stop thinking about fantasy football all the time. Yeah. But that's the sort of stuff. We're all biased towards our team. We're, I'm not thinking about MJ's team and Monk's not thinking about Rid's team. We're all no. working out. What happens if I just did a four-and-a-half-hour drive, MJ, and I was trying to plan the next three weeks' worth of trades listening to football podcasts on the way home. Yeah, yeah. That's what we do, yeah? That's that's yeah. what we do as a coach. So grab your team and work out, what do you want out of this guy? Is there a better option? Is there a bigger hole in your line? It might be F6. It might be F5. It might be D3. You might not have she's all right now. Is it worth that investment to try and close that gap? I would say no right now. But if you and your team and you've been focused on your team, thinks it's going to hurt you so much, you have to sometimes just bite the bullet and close those gaps, yeah? Yeah. I, I think that's just a really great point to finish up on. That, that I, and, I, and I don't want to overhash it, but it's nobody knows your team better than you do. Nobody knows what your aim is for a season better than you do. And nobody knows what you want to do trades-wise for your team for the next three or four weeks better than you do. Yeah, Sometimes, absolutely. as much as we can give advice as content creators about which players we think are really good players to bring in, which ones we'd be avoiding, who do trading out, who are the targets coming up. In the end, you've just got to make that decision yourself and just back your gut in sometimes. Yeah. Some some ripper advice from both you lads throughout this episode. Mini Mark Rids, thank you for once again just guiding us beautifully through this episode with some great advice that's going to help us with our AFL fantasy sides. If you're listening to this audio podcast and you haven't subscribed just yet, wherever you're listening, you can go back, subscribe, and as soon as um, the podcast episodes, whether it be this or anything else that drops during the season proper, you'll get notified straight away. You can also make sure you watch these videos over on YouTube subscribe just simply search for the coaches panel you can watch these episodes we do throw in the occasional bonus video episode that doesn't actually turn into an audio podcast so if you want to maximize every bit of content you can get from the coaches panel jump over to youtube or become a patreon they get maxed content from us whether it be at that cash cow that breakout or premium tier level there is a ton of additional rewards depending on what you want to get involved for all the links to join our patreon to follow us on social media and where you can find the audio and video podcasts. You can find it all in the description of this episode. Hey, thanks so much for tuning in. We wish you well in this final week of Best 18 before we hit another batch of Best 22s. We hope Rookie Roulette is kind. We hope your captain calls goes well. And until next week, good luck, and we'll chat to you soon.